Good morning and welcome on behalf of the League of Women Voters. I'm Peggy Creer, president of the Milwaukee County League. The League was founded in 1920 as a grassroots nonpartisan organization. 1920 is the year the 19th Amendment was passed. So this is an exciting centennial year for us. The League was formed as a natural transition <clears throat> from a movement to obtain women's suffrage to an organization dedicated to encouraging people to become informed voters and to engage with their elected representatives to promote better government. The League's mission to empower voters and defend democracy is as vital today as it was at its founding. We do all of our work in a nonpartisan manner, meaning we never endorse or oppose a political party or candidate. We provide unbiased information on voting and elections. We do that on our website, through social media, and on vote411.org. We also study issues and promote government policies that serve the public interest, and we present educational forums like today's program. I invite you to learn more about the League on our website, lwvmilwaukee.org, and I invite you to join us. We welcome all members. Uh, we just keep the name to um, honor our founders. I'd like to thank the Program Planning Committee who put together today's program. That's Eloisa Gomez, Diane Steigerwald, Mary Sussman, and Margarita Garcia Rojas. And now I'll turn things over to Margarita, who is chair of the Planning Committee. Margarita is a recent UW-Milwaukee graduate in Latin American Studies and History, and she's beginning her PhD work. So thank you very much for joining us today to talk about this important topic. Margarita? Hello, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for being here today. Um, first, I'd like to take a moment to thank my planning committee who trusted me uh, trusted me and guided me through the process of organizing this event. Last year, I was only a panelist um, for this event, and I'm really honored to have been given the chance to be the chair this year. I would also like to thank the lovely Alicia Rodriguez for creating our flyer, as well as our amazing co-sponsors, which are the ACLU of Wisconsin, Averno College, the Catholic Coalition for Migrants and Refugees, Jewish Voice for Peace Milwaukee, the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, uh, UW-Milwaukee's Cultures and Communities Department, and the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition. Um, it is very overwhelming the amount of kindness, cooperation, and understanding by everyone we worked with during a time when our world was turned upside down and every aspect of our lives were disrupted. But unfortunately, the world, the politics, and immigration policies continued. Family separations, detention, deportations, uh, asylum seekers at the border being turned away, and the state of uncertainty for hundreds of thousands of dreamers and their families, as and their families experience as the announcement of whether or not DACA or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals will continue to stay in place by the Supreme Court, and they will be deciding that um, sometime this month. So certainly there's a lot going on and 2020 has been an eventful year thus far and it is only June. And there's so much to learn and understand. So thank you all for being here again because we really have to be aware of the experiences of the immigrant community in order to find ways to be actively involved through acti activism and voting. Um, so again, I hope you all enjoy this presentation and ask questions um, that are our amazing moderator, Kathleen Dunn, um, will be um, um, organizing at the end. Um, so I'll pass it over to Kathleen. Thank you. Kathleen, you're muted. Eventually, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> All right, here we go. Good morning, Buenos dias. Uh, we gather at a time, as Margarita said, when there is a great deal of upheaval in this country and in the world, massive protests against racism and police brutality all over this country and really all over the world. A pandemic continues to rage. So it's understandable, but perhaps not forgivable, that we've lost sight of asylum seekers, DACA, how migrants in detention centers are being affected by COVID-19. But today we're going to return to setting our sights on those very important issues. 
There was a recent lengthy and important New York Times piece uh, this week. Detainees are demanding that centers take measures to prevent them from the virus. Many are making their own masks from scraps of torn clothing or broken disposable metal containers. There have been many protests, some hunger strikes. The federal government has sealed the borders to asylum seekers during the pandemic. The testing of detainees and who knows how many there really are, has been very late in coming. Only 2,600 detained people out of many, many more than that have been tested and more than half are positive. The Supreme Court will soon rule on DACA, 800,000 directly affected uh, by this decision. Our distinguished panel, and they are really wonderful, will be shedding light on these issues. They've been to the Southern border. They have represented individuals in removal proceedings including unaccompanied minor children placed in removal proceedings. We'll hear about what they have seen and what those of us listening and watching today can do to lessen the pain and change this very broken system. I'll be introducing each speaker before her presentation and when all have spoken, we'll have a chance to question and uh, response. Our first speaker is Aaron. Is Aaron there? Aaron Barbado has done extensive work. Hi, Aaron. Aaron is. We'll be there in a minute. There she is. Um, <laughs> there we go. Hi, Aaron. Uh, she's done extensive work uh, in immigration law. She's director of the Immigration Justice Clinic at the University of Wisconsin Law School. She teaches second and third year law students to represent individuals in removal proceedings and also with humanitarian-based immigration relief. She was a founding member of Barbado Immigration Law, executive director and staff attorney at Community Immigration Law, managed a boutique immigration law from Madison's office, was staff attorney with Catholic Charities, Legal Services for Immigrants, and is a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the Wisconsin Bar Association, and the Board of Community Immigration Law Center. She's going to be discussing the current state of DACA, details significant changes to the immigration system during the Trump administration and during COVID-19, and also document the success of a wall. We have a lot of walls going up in this country right now, but not across our southern border. They're in Washington, D.C., and a wall that she describes that blocks almost all immigration into the United States. Erin. Thank you so much for the introduction, Kathleen, and thank you everyone for um, being here. I'm just gonna pull up my PowerPoint. Um, and let's see, okay. Everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, I think by showing up, you are taking the first step. And Oops. Is everybody hearing that recording? Hold on. Um, Everybody see this? Yes. yes, it looks great. Okay, great. Um, I need to go back to the beginning. I apologize. Okay. So thank you everyone for being here and for um, being here to learn about what is truly going on in our immigration system. This has been a really incredible almost four years um, of the Trump administration. And I want to take um, a, just, I have 10 minutes to go through an incredible amount of information, um, but I want to provide a summary of some of the major immigration policy changes, a summary of changes due to COVID-19, and then DACA, look at a brief history, and then what are we looking at when we um, learn of the Supreme Court's decision in the next um, few weeks. So we all have known what Trump's policy um, on immigration has been. Um, he has built a policy wall. He, um, when he first announced his candidacy, he made it very clear he wanted to build a physical wall on the southern border. But that did not occur. Um, but he sure was successful in building a policy wall that has blocked almost all immigration into the United States at this time. When he first uh, entered office, he immediately announced that he had a border security and immigration enforcement improvement. And this is an executive order, an executive order um, similar to what Obama did with DACA. So um, he was gonna build a wall. And the same day he announced that he was gonna, through his executive order of enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States. Um, that means that he increased enforcement, enforcement of immigration customs enforcement officers and custom border protection. So, um, those were two huge messages. No one can get in, we're gonna build a wall. 
and those that are in immigrants who are in the United States, you should fear because we're increasing um, enforcement. We felt this in Wisconsin in September of 2018. ICE had four days where they um, basically wreaked havoc on our communities and people are still in fear of um, additional ICE um, information and ICE um, aggression in Wisconsin. We also can't forget about the executive order 16769, which there was a 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, but eventually the Supreme Court said that um, the president has the power to bar many people from entering the United States. Um, and Trump made it very clear that he wanted to bar people from Muslim majority countries through this. Um, Trump has also barred, uh, canceled temporary protected status for many countries, including Nicaragua and Honduras. So people are living in limbo right now, not knowing where, where their future will lead them. I don't think any of us will ever forget um, when Jeff Sessions announced the zero tolerance policy and the number of children that were separated from their families um, when our government had no way of uh, reuniting our families or keeping track of where um, these asylum seekers had gone. We at the Immigrant Justice Clinic, we represent a number of families that were separated during this time and some children that were permanently separated from, from their families. The executive office also has uh, lots of power, has almost exclusive power over refugees. And um, Uzo is gonna talk about the asylum um, changes in a little bit, but I just wanted to highlight that you can see here the number of refugees um, from 2016 was 85,000 with 10,000 um, specifically saved for, um, for Syria. But now Trump um, in 2020 announced that there'll be 18,000. That's the, the cap. 18,000 refugees will be admitted into the United States. Maybe, it doesn't have to meet, meet that cap. Maybe be um, admitted when the number of refugees has never been higher in the world. We are closing our borders to people that are fleeing, um, fleeing their countries because of persecution um, and not allowing them to seek refuge in the United States. Hey, Erin, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. It seems like your PowerPoint isn't working exactly Oh Pardon no, me. we're not. We're not seeing the slide changes. Oh, you're not. No. Shoot. Okay. Um. Hold on. Can you see it now or no? Uh. Yes. Yeah. Let's see. You're probably gonna have to share the screen again. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Nothing. You got it. Oh. I'm so sorry. Okay. Let's see. Share. Let's see. Can you see it now? Anyone? Yeah, we can see the, uh, but we're seeing your previews too, just in here. Okay. Now are you seeing it? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, I went through all these already, but I'll share these slides later for other people to, um, to look at. But refugees, now the new public charge rule that bars almost everybody into the United States who um, does not have a lot of money and financial resources, regardless of whether you're entering based on employment or family um, into the United States. Now, due to COVID-19, Trump has pretty much closed off all borders. And I think Uzo will probably talk about this as well, but we're turning away asylum seekers at the southern border and close our borders um, to, to family-based and employment-based immigration as well. So I discussed a lot a little bit about um, these executive orders that Trump had um, put in place at the beginning of during his um, presidency. But I want to look at um, one of Obama's executive orders, and that was from 2012. This was rescinded by Attorney General Jeff Sessions um, on September 5th of 2017. Um, Sessions said that this um, Obama administration policy and executive order was unlawful. Um, Obama signed this, in, signed this executive order in June 15th. And really, the, um, this was not to be permanent, but this was to be a way for um, 
to, to, to save people from deportation while we gave Congress an ability to, to act and um, Congress an ability to put in place a permanent fix to some of our issues with immigration. Um, and Obama said that this was the right thing to do. The requirements for DACA were high. You had their age limits, education requirements, as well as no one could have any contact, basically no contact with, with law enforcement as well. Um, but DACA wasn't, isn't, only provides temporary benefits. So deferred action, people with DACA can have a, their driver's license and ability to work, um, but there's no independent pathway to citizenship. There's no permanency to this. And it's discretionary with US citizenship and immigration. So it's problematic. And until Congress acts, um, nothing will change for um, people with DACA. Right now, after the rescission of DACA, people with DACA have been able to continue to um, renew their, um, their work permits and their DACA deferred action, but there have been no new DACA beneficiaries um, permitted to apply. Um, and this was only because of a lawsuit filed by the New York Attorney General and 15 other states that has made its way up to the Supreme Court. Um, I just want to look quickly at the numbers. Um, according to the Migration Policy Institute, there are about, currently, as of December of 2019, about um, almost 700,000 people with DACA. If it hadn't been um, terminated by the Trump administration, there would be about double that in the United States. And in Wisconsin, we have almost 7,000 people with DACA. And if it hadn't been terminated, then there would have been almost double that as well. People with DACA are from all over the world, majority from Mexico, but really representative people from all over the globe. So what is the status of the current DACA litigation? On November 12th, the Supreme Court held oral arguments in a case consolidating three legal challenges. Um, and we're waiting on a decision, most likely in the next few weeks in June, but it possibly go into July because the Supreme Court is a little bit backed up due to COVID. But there have been a number of organizations um, and movements to ask the Supreme Court to hold off on the decision until we have a vaccine or until COVID is under control because of the trauma that this may cause to so many people with DACA in our country. I wanna briefly summarize the three possible outcomes of the Supreme Court. First is the Supreme Court decides the Trump administration termination of DACA is not reviewable by the court. The administration can then terminate DACA, and then we'll have to wait on further information on what will happen with people currently with DACA or with pending applications. Alternatively, the court may decide that it can review the, the decision of DACA and that the rule, rules of the termination of DACA was unlawful. If that occurs, DACA will continue and new applicants may be eligible to, to apply right away. However, the administration may attempt to terminate based on a new legal theory. Third, the court may find that it has re ability to review the decision to end DACA and find, find that the Trump administration's termination of DACA was lawful. The administration can then, um, the DACA will be terminated and we will need to know more information to determine um, what will happen for people who currently have DACA and with pending applications. So we don't know what's gonna happen, but I think we all want to be prepared. And so if the court's decision um, terminates DACA, will individuals face, what will, if, are there enforcement risks basically? And so people really need to know their rights and people without DACA also need to, the, to know rights so that we can be advocates and allies in, in this, um, in this situation because we don't know what's going to happen um, but we want people to make sure that they know their rights in terms of whether they're eligible for other um, immigration benefits and what happens if there is enforcement um, so there are a lot of organizations around wisconsin that are offering free consultations and information to people with daca um, and so if the court decision de terminates daca what do we do well even if they ex it, um, do not terminate DACA, we all need to act because DACA is not a permanent solution. So Congress needs to act to create a law. We need to educate ourselves about what those options are and we need to exercise our right to vote if we want to continue to protect people um, with DACA and then also advocate for a permanent solution to um, ensure that we have fair immigration reform 
for um, people with DACA, but also so many other people in our population. So, so that's all I have, and I think I'll turn it over to Aisa now. Yes, thank you very much, Erin. We'll have many questions. We're going to wait on all questions until all the panelists have done their presentations. Uh, we already see people coming in with questions for you, so hold on, we'll get to them in a moment. Um, our second panelist is um, Aisa Olivares. She's managing attorney at the Community Immigration Law Center, and she provides deportation defense. She has represented many clients in removal and bond proceedings and also in appeals. She was a staff attorney at the Pro Bono Asylum Representation uh, Children's Project, represented unaccompanied minor children who were placed in removal proceedings by the Department of Homeland Security in Harlington, Texas. She in law school participated in the Immigrant Justice Clinic and the Defenders Project at UW-Madison Law School. She's been awarded the Bell Case La Follette Award by the Wisconsin Law Foundation for her work with underserved communities. She will present information about the current state of civil detention for immigrants and what is occurring right now at Wisconsin's Dodge County Corrections Facility. Aisa. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and all the participants who are here today. Um, I feel really fortunate to be amongst my esteemed colleagues, Erin. Um, I think that um, they are really great people and really great women, really great lawyers, and I'm, I'm really lucky to be with them. So I'm going to share my screen um, so that everyone can see the presentation. So Kathleen was right. I'm going to speak today on immigration detention and going through it in um, 10 minutes is going to be difficult. Um, but um, I think that we will be able to clarify a lot of the issues and the overlapping issues between Aaron's presentation and also Maka's presentation when we start the panel and the Q&A afterwards. Um, so <clears throat> We'll discuss today the context of immigration detention nationally. I wanna make sure everybody understands the scope and how much immigration detention has grown over the years. We'll talk about detention um, during these times of COVID-19 and what we're seeing here locally in Wisconsin. So how many people are in immigration detention? Right now there is a national daily average of about 50,000 people being detained by the Department of Homeland Security in immigration facilities. Um, you can see how since 1994, this number, these numbers of people who are detained, these daily averages have grown. Um, the Washington Post reported that there was fewer than 7,000 people in 1994, and we are now 25 years later seeing six times that number. And um, we're seeing now also um, admissions into ICE facilities be higher um, during um, the most recent years. Uh, and you can see uh, how the spikes um, in, in 2017. So who are we detaining? Um, Aaron referenced to the, the people that were picked up here in Wisconsin in September. We know, um, you know that we have many facilities nationally and I'll show you soon a, a map of what that looks like, but who are we detaining? Who is the Department of Homeland Security arresting and putting into these facilities? And these are people who are awaiting um, decisions in their removal cases, right? Who are in a removal proceeding, uh, people who have overstayed their visas and maybe are going to start a removal proceeding for overstaying that visa. So after a lawful entry, um, people who recently came to the United States, um, lawful permanent residents, and um, we have most recently also seen workplace raids, not necessarily here um, in Wisconsin recently, but we have heard about them in other areas in the Midwest. We have common misconceptions about who can be arrested and placed in removal proceedings and deported. Um, I know often um, when I speak to crowds, they're like, well, but he has a US citizen child. How can they do this to him or her? How can they um, separate them from their family and put them behind, um, behind bars and you know, in an orange jumpsuit and without communication with their family? How can they do this? 
Um, being a parent of a U.S. citizen child is not a protection from deportation, unfortunately. Um, and so we often see parents of U.S. citizen children in these facilities. Um, we also see people who have lived in the United States for 15, 20, 25, even 30 years. Um, people who are homeowners, business owners, people who are green card holders are also at risk of deportation and are also people we have seen in these facilities. Um, and uh, people who have not had the chance um, to see an immigration judge. Um, so where are people being, um, the people who are being detained, where are they from? We can see here a chart um, for countries of origin, um, and we can see that mainly those people from Mexico um, and our Northern Triangle countries are the people who are in these facilities. Here's a small graph that shows um, exactly who, why, what entity is arresting people right now and placing them um, in detention. And uh, we can see um, the numbers 38% uh, by ICE, that's internal enforcement, right, within the United States, and about 61% by um, Customs and Border Patrol. And these are um, officers who are stationed um, on our borders. We most often hear about them on our southern borders. Um, and I'm sure Usomaka will speak about their role um, in detaining asylum seekers uh, at the border. So where does this occur, right? Um, immigration proceedings are civil. It's important to know that um, when people are arrested, they're arrested for basically an enforcement of civil, uh, civil law of um, immigration is a civil law. So um, it's basically like being in a family court is a civil, it's also civil. Um, and so that's the area of law that we are, are working with when we're talking about enforcement of immigration law. Um, and these facilities across the nation are ICE run facilities. There's also private facilities and there's also local jails. And that's what we see here in Wisconsin that contract with ICE and the Department of Homeland Security to detain individuals locally. Here's some more information about who, um, who's benefiting, who gets these contracts for the private immigration detention. So you can see how many facilities we have nationally. Um, and there is some information there about um, who is operating each of those facilities. In Wisconsin, um, we had two locations, and I say had because um, the Kenosha facility actually at the beginning of um, the outbreak of COVID-19, their sheriff said, actually, we're no longer going to accept people from the Department of Homeland Security, whether that conversation meant to be a temporary um, assertion or a permanent assertion, he asked that no new people be brought into his facility um, so that they could protect the current population that was in there. Um, the Department of Homeland Security basically um, communicated that they were unhappy with that decision by pulling everybody from that facility, um, over 200 people or close to 200 people out of that facility and transferring them across the United States, um, including and mostly in Illinois, Southern Illinois, about um, seven to 10 hours um, from the facility um, in Dodge County. And so currently we only have the Dodge County facility in Wisconsin that is holding people for the Department of Homeland Security and there is about 200 beds uh, at that facility. You can see I've mapped out a bit um, the difficulties for people who are detained by immigration, um, how they have to travel from um, the Dodge County facility all the way to Chicago for their court, for their final court hearing. And they're often um, in their jumpsuit, they're um, handcuffed um, during that ride. Um, and usually that ride begins at about three or four in the morning um, so that they can arrive in sh to Chicago on time for their final hearing. Um, preliminary hearings are held via video teleconference, um, but um, our clients do make this ride um, you know, in a van while they're handcuffed um, for their final hearing. Here's some information about the average amount of time that people are held in detention. 
and how expensive it is to actually um, hold people every single day. We are concerned about the expansion of immigration detention because of the number of deaths, um, because of um, the lack of really safe health care that is given to people who are in detention. Um, we've also seen, when we talked about earlier, who's in detention, US citizens who are mistakenly in detention. And so um, we know that an expansion of beds uh, means an expansion of people that they need to put into the facility. Um, and that, you know, uh, as immigrant advocates, um, makes us very afraid for what that could look like. So COVID-19 um, in the facility. There's no room for social distancing inside of a facility. Um, there are lots of people, there are very common areas, there are cafeterias. Um, so there's very little room for social distancing in these facilities, which makes it very scary for our clients. Um, they report feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, they report feeling scared. Um, and they report also, um, we have seen people who have said, I'm just going to go back to my home country. Uh, I can't, um, I can't be in here anymore. I am so afraid of, of dying of the coronavirus. So there's no room for social distancing in these facilities. And ICE has discretion to release individuals on alternatives to detention, like GPS or a bond or um, having them check in routinely uh, with ICE maybe once a week or once every two weeks. Um, but we also know that they haven't really used that power very much nationally since COVID-19 started and the detention numbers are down, but they're really down because we're not allowing any new people in. And also Maka will go over um, what, we've, what we've done and the policies that have been implemented to stop asylum seekers. So really our detention numbers are down because we're not seeing asylum seekers right now. We've seen hunger strikes in the facility, uh, people you know, fighting for their lives, trying to send a message and protest that the conditions are not okay and that they need to be released. Um, they report seeing officers with, who are not taking this seriously, who are not wearing masks, who are not wearing gloves, um, and maybe they don't have access to the cleaning materials that they think are necessary. And so they don't feel safe. Um, I know that one particular group in Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia went on a hunger strike. There's a great New York Times article um, titled, titled uh, Fear, Illness, and Death in ICE Detention um, that outlines basically the story of one man that the journalists followed who was on a hunger strike there in that facility. We know that litigation in federal courts has been successful and that 392 people have been ordered released by a federal judge um, due to their medical vulnerabilities. So thank you to the ACLU and IJC and IJC. Those are just a few of the organizations that are carrying this litigation forward locally. So I'm gonna try and um, go through this quickly, but um, you know, national trends, like I said, we're seeing um, that people are being detained um, and there's broader enforcement priorities. Um, and we, used to see in the Obama era, uh, people who were detained because they were believed to be a danger to the community or because they had committed some sort of crime. And now we are seeing people being detained for pending charges. And so that innocence, um, that, that presumption of innocence um, is, is no longer attaches to an individual who is a non-citizen. Um, they're gonna be taken in by ICE regardless of pending charges. And um, they're gonna be placed in removal proceedings and sometimes stay in that facility for a very long time. We also know that um, immigration judges have been stripped of their discretion to either terminate cases or administratively close cases um, because they um, now have quotas that they have to meet and complete cases much faster. Locally here in Dane County, we've seen an increase in courthouse arrests actually inside of our Dane County courthouse. Um, an increase in focus on arresting individuals with domestic violence or alcohol related, related pending offenses, um, and an increase in people with pending criminal charges, like I said earlier, individuals who have not been found guilty necessarily of a pending charge, but who have these uh, pending criminal charges, forcing them to not only face an immigration judge, but also a criminal judge from, um, from behind a detention facility, from behind bars, basically, even though they've posted a local bond. And so 
the local Dane County is saying, we're gonna release them on bond and ICE scoops in, sweeps in, takes them to Dodge. So moving forward, we know that we're gonna see an increased scrutiny and enforcement, um, and we're gonna to have to support our community through knowledgeable um, representation and trusted resources are really very important. Um, our organization and the Immigrant Justice Clinic are the two organizations that serve the Dodge County facility. And so you can always reach out to us and ask questions about what's going on locally. And I look forward to your questions moving forward. Thank you so much. And Wusumaka, I believe you um, are next. You're still muted. There we go, there we go. Okay, so. thank you, Lisa. Um, our next panelist is Uzumaka Enzalebe. She's a clinical associate professor of law at Northwestern Pritzker's School of Law, where she directs the Immigration Law Clinic. She has extensive experience in representing asylum seekers. She has led student trips to the southern border uh, to work with migrants in Mexico who are affected by U.S. asylum policy. Most recently, she was in Tijuana, Mexico in January of 2020, working with asylum seekers. She has firsthand knowledge of the humanitarian crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border, and she will speak to the current state of asylum in the United States, uh, the response to COVID-19, and the drastic changes to the asylum system during the Trump administration. Thank you, Kathleen. And I'm going to just uh, take a moment to share my screen. Okay. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. Yes. Um, so good morning. Um, I, as Kathleen said, I direct the Immigration Law Clinic at Northwestern Pittsburgh School of Law. And I've been doing so for the last 16 years. And um, my clinic primarily represents unaccompanied children. And we also represent parents who are at risk um, of separation from their children. Um, my job today is to try to introduce you to um, some of the issues that are happening um, that our asylum seekers face along the Southwest border. And I always say that I, the purpose of my presentation really is twofold, to make you a more educated consumer of the news and also to just make you a more educated voter, right? So, and it's, I can't tell, I teach a whole class on this issue, so it's very difficult to sort of condense my presentation into 10, 15 minutes, but I, what, I, what I hope to leave you with is a flavor and a desire to learn more and uh, a new lens by which you're going to read information and process information that you hear about in the news. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So what is asylum and what role does international law play in asylum? So US asylum, I, I'm, I love um, Marvel and I'm a big superhero fan. And so I think of asylum as a type of superhero and asylum's origin story. So most superheroes have an origin story and asylum's origin story kind of traces itself back to World War II and the need to protect certain people from their own governments. Um, so post-World War II, the UN had an agreement um, called the 1951 Convention Relating to the Status of Refugees. And what that agreement tried to do was to address the light, large migrations that happened um, due to the Second World War. It also attempted to set forth an internationally agreed upon standard for who would be considered a refugee. The 1951 um, convention was limited in that it focused almost exclusively on who was a refugee in 1951. So the UN created another document, the 1967 protocol that was forward looking and um, would sort of take into consideration who would be an, a refugee um, after 1951. The US in 1981 sort of grabbed it, modified and grabbed the definition of refugee and enacted it as domestic law. So is asylum domestic or international? The way I like to think of it is that asylum is, our asylum laws are domestic, but they have their grounding in the international principles in the 1951 convention and the 1967 protocol. So 
what does it mean to, uh, to get asylum? Um, and like I said, I spend a whole course on just asylum. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is to kind of give you a way of understanding it and simplify it for you. Um, to get asylum, the first thing is that you have to be physically present in the United States. This is incredibly important, right? So you cannot seek asylum status in another country. You have to come to the United States to seek asylum. And you can come to the United States, it doesn't matter if you arrive at a designated port of arrival or port of entry, or you come by other ways, right? So we think this is such an important um, remedy that we allow you to come in any way you can to ask for it. Um, the other really important thing to know about asylum is that you have to meet this refugee definition that we just mentioned in the previous slide. The refugee definition has many components, but I'm just going to give you the pieces that you need to start off, right? To start off the refugee definition, you have to have a government actor or a non-state actor the government cannot or will not control. You have to have severe harms. And the person who's doing the harms has to be doing it um, for one of five reasons, your race, your nationality, your political opinion, your religion, or something called social group. And then you have to sort of say how you know that that's the reason why the person is acting. So you need some evidence linking the harms to one of the five reasons. The big takeaway here is that asylum is very specific and that it's meant to come in, it's supposed to swoop in, when we feel that the government is acting in a bad way towards its citizens, or we feel that the government cannot protect or will not protect its citizens. So the rest of my presentation will sort of talk about the Southwest border. And I always like to start with a visual of the Southwest border. Why? I want you to understand how big it is, right? So when we talk about building walls and we talk about sort of managing this part of the country it's you know it encompasses like four states some of the biggest states so te texas in itself is a fairly large state um, it has rivers and deserts and so it's this massive part of our country the other thing to understand about the southwest border is that we have official places along the southwest border called ports of entry that people can come and ask for asylum this map I'm showing you has a few of the ports of entry. It has probably some of the more important ports of entry, but um, it doesn't have all of them. But I thought I wanted to introduce this idea of a port of entry as an official place where somebody might be able to ask for um, asylum. So I'm going to do even a little bit more immigration. Bear with me. I want to introduce you to the concept of entry. So entry, there's there are three ways we kind of talk about entry in immigration law. We talk about people who are admitted, right? So the first picture that, that is right over here shows someone being admitted. And that's when you, are, you, you present your paperwork to an official, the official looks at it, stamps it, and lets you in. The second picture um, describes what the statute calls arriving alien. And somebody who's a fan of sci-fi and fantasy, when I think alien, I think space, um, but our uh, our immigration laws are written and the word alien appears several times to refer to people who are from foreign countries. So arriving alien is somebody who is coming to a port of entry. Remember this idea of port of entry, an official place, um, and asking to be let in, maybe without the correct documents or without any documents at all. And then the last concept I want to introduce is this idea of entering without inspection. And these are people who may cross between ports of entry, who may enter the United States without authorization between ports of entries. Okay, so this is another sort of important chart that kind of plays on what I, some ideas I just introduced you to. So one way the US government gauges how many people are crossing the Southwest border without authorization is to look at the number of apprehensions between ports of entry. This chart shows Southwest border apprehensions over the last 50 plus years. Um, so what I want you to notice about this chart is that the numbers were pretty high in the 2000, um, during the 2000 period. So in fiscal year 2000, the number of apprehensions along the Southwest border reached a high of about 1.6 million. The last time the number of apprehensions reached 1 million was in fiscal year 2006. 
The other really important point I want you to take away is that in fiscal year 2017, so at the beginning of this administration, the total numbers of apprehensions were relatively low. We only had about 300,000 300, or 304,000 people who were being apprehended at the border. So at the start of this administration, we did not have a crisis of numbers. We did not have a crisis of numbers. We did not have an all-time high number of people crossing the border, right? So despite what the rhetoric suggested at the time, we did not have this massive problem. In fact, some would argue we were at low, relatively low levels at the beginning of the Trump administration. So what did we have, right? So I don't wanna leave the impression that there wasn't something happening along the border. What we had along the border was changing demographics. So who was coming to the border was changing in two significant ways. One is that more people from Central America were coming to the border. By 2014, the number of Central Americans coming to the border had outpaced the number of Mexicans who were coming to the border. In 2019, for example, 72% of people apprehended along the border were from um, Guatemala, Honduras, and to a lesser extent, El Salvador. We refer to these three countries as the, as the Northern Triangle countries. If you take it even so if you dive even deeper at the demographics, what you will see is that more and more unaccompanied children in a category that DHS refers to as fam use or family units were coming. So if you start in 2013, we had about um, let's just look at family units, for example. We had about 15,000 family units coming in 2013. And unaccompanied children and family units made up 13% of the people who were being apprehended at the border. By 2018, um, you had about, even in 2000, during the Obama administration, you had about, it was the number of family units and unaccompanied children were rising. At the end of fiscal year 2019, you had about 64% of, about 65% of the people who were being apprehended were unaccompanied children and family units. And this is not a typo, right? So this number that's approaching 500,000 is not a typo, right? So compared to 15,000 to about 77,000 during the end of the Obama administration to about uh, 500,000 um, in fiscal year 2019. This is important to understand because unaccompanied children and family units use our systems differently. They, are, they tend to be fleeing violence, they tend to ask for asylum, and the way that they are processed is very different than the way you might process an adult male who's coming from Mexico. Our systems along the borders have not adapted to take into consideration that the demographics um, has changed. And a lot of what we're seeing, the so-called crisis that we're seeing, is the refusal, some might argue, or at least, if you just descriptive, um, the fact that we haven't really adopted and accommodated that this change is happening. So I'm gonna run through a couple charts really quickly that kind of just build on this story that I've just introduced you to. So in 2017, you will see that December is sort of at the end of the Obama administration. I see that people were, my hypothesis is that people were rushing in to sort of um, come in because the rhetoric had been so strong in the in the prior so prior election years about the border closing but what we did see when the trump administration took office is that the numbers were very low right in fact i represent primarily unaccompanied children and in april 2017 i thought i was just going to go retire like i thought well a thousand kids cross the border it's time to find something different to do this isn't going to happen anymore um, and so the numbers were really low, even though the rhetoric was really ratcheting up, right? So this was 2017. Um, in 2018, we begin to see some, the, the numbers increasing, the number of family units crossing increasing. Still not a big, overall, the numbers were still relatively low. So we had about 5,000 family units crossed in October 2017. And maybe by the summer, right, May 2018, um, we had about um, 9,500. So that May 2017, when we saw sort of that, you know, gradual, right, taking the number of family units who were crossing, but overall still very low numbers. 
was also the summer that we saw the zero, zero tolerance that Erin um, sort of alluded to early on in her presentation. So I call this the summer of family separation. And what happened was that the numbers had been very low in 2017 and they had started increasing, but the administration wanted to really be tough on um, immigration. And so even though that this increase was gradual and not really um, overall, not really a big increase, there was a lot of policies that were thrown at the problem. And one of the policies that was thrown at the problem is sort of the zero tolerance policy, which um, what and what the and, and the reason why is that the Trump administration wanted to stop the flow of migrants, but was hamstrung by U.S. asylum law, which allowed people to enter the U.S. to apply for asylum. A 2008 law called the TVPRA that provided certain procedural safeguards for unaccompanied children, and the 1996 settlement agreement, which made it difficult to detain mothers and their children for more than 20 days. Frustrated with these laws and um, orders, the Trump administration decided to sort of bypass legislative branch and started moving aggressively with administrative policies. And the family separation policy, um, or the most visible policy that summer, was the one that required criminal prosecution of anyone entering the US between ports of entry. These criminal prosecutions resulted in children being separated from their parents. So the parents were sort of herded into a criminal um, path. And as a result, they had their children taken away from them. And we saw sort of the tragedy that happened um, at the border in the summer of 2018. So the fall of 2018, I called caravan meets midterm elections. At this point in time, there were the midterm elections were happening in November 2018. And at the same time, there was groups of people traveling together, primarily to be safe, who were heading to the border and the Trump administration um, sent troops down. I don't know if people remember this incident. It seems like 2020 makes everything seem like so, so long ago. But my, my PowerPoint sort of shows some of the things that were happening. It was around this time in November 2018, I was enjoying Thanksgiving at my um, in-laws in Cleveland when I received an email um, that said, emergency, emergency, we need people at the border to come and help people who are arriving as part of this um, so-called caravan. So I decided then that I would, I didn't know exactly how, but I decided that I would take my students to the border to help an organization called El Otro Lado, who was providing um, sort of know your rights and legal intakes for migrants who are at the border. So we thought we had seen the worst um, when we were in Tijuana in um, 2019, January 2019. Um, the picture that I have shows how just the chaos, right? And what, what the people are doing there at a port of entry and what they're doing is they're adding their name to some, a list. And this list is, um, was created to address a policy called metering. The metering policy basically um, requires people to, who go to the port of entry, so people who want to sort of go through the port of entry and raise their hand to ask for asylum to sort of, they kind of said, we can only allow a very small number of people to make, come in and raise their hand. And as a result, a backlog was created and the migrants themselves created this list to sort of manage this um, backlog and to control how people are called to go and present themselves at the port of entry. So we saw the list in effect and this picture just really pretty much um, shows people who are trying to put themselves on the list. So 2019, so 2019, we have the Trump administration pushing family separation. There was a lot of pushback from advocates who tried to prevent some of the worst of the administration's policies. There was success at the early stages in sort of the um, um, trial level courts. But as 2019 started, advocates began to lose and many of the administration's um, policies started taking it into effect. It was also a time, I think my hypothesis is that migrants became incredibly worried that the border was going to close. And so more and more and more and more people started coming to the border because there was so much uncertainty about when these policies will take into effect and then the border would close. That's sort of my hypothesis, my observations of what I was seeing. So what you see are drastic jumps in the number, but these are not typos, right? So you had about 23,000 people at the beginning of 2019 fiscal year. And by May, you had almost 85,000, just, just family units crossing the border. 
This led to what I call the tension summer. So I don't know if you remember last summer, the Trump administration refused to accommodate increase in numbers at the border. It created deplorable conditions leading to the DHS's own Office of Inspector General to issue a report. The US government uh, was keeping migrants in facilities that were designed to hold people for 70 who held at the border during um, this detention summer. Some of our clients talked about having spent 45 days without being able to take a shower, without brushing their teeth. As someone who's a point um, in our government in, um, uh, take shower for three days. And amazing that conditions are worse. Now, migrants will be two weeks wide. They were this list, right? We stand at the port of entry and ask for. We are losing your audio. Um, Uzumaka, maybe you want to uh, stop your video and see if we're able to um, catch up. Do you want to try to um, finish your presentation just audio only? Hello, everyone. I'm back. I apologize that my internet is was having some difficulty there. So I don't know how much of my presentation I was able to give. <laughs> um, but I think some of the stuff that I had planned to cover, I'm happy to um, do so. I, I'm happy to continue or I'm also happy to do so in the question and answer period. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how much of the presentation I was able to um, through. So, so we heard you talking um, last, I think, more about uh, the treatment of folks at the border and um, going 45 days without showers or brushing their teeth. Okay, um, thank you so much for sort of telling me where I am now. So I'm just going to speak through because we're sort of running, uh, I apologize for the, the internet. Um, so I was sort of talking about our, our second trip to Tijuana in January of 2020, the things that we saw there. Um, and how do I, I call it wait, wait, and eat some more. So Aaron sort of talked about this invisible wall. Um, and I also kind of want to bring it home to my area, which is to talk about the invisible assault. And this invisible for um, people to uh, seek asylum along the border. Um, so you have the GHS's metering policy, the um, the asylum office, uh, the DHS's metering policy, um, the remain in Mexico, the, the just a whole bunch of things that have now made it incredibly difficult for people to continue to seek asylum along the border. The final thing I want to talk about is just uh, just how COVID nineteen has affected um, the situation along the border. What you will see is that the numbers were relatively low before. COVID-19, so what I'm showing you is the early part of fiscal year 2020. And so I put at the bottom in parentheses the, the corresponding number from the previous fiscal year. So we were, the, 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 the Trump administration had finally succeeded with sort of making it very difficult for asylum um, seekers at the border. 
But then we have COVID-19. And when, when COVID-19 things were done. One is this um, the administration kind of reached back to a or law to um, they find uh, crossing the border for the entry. Uzumaka, I'm so sorry that your uh, internet's been going in and out, so we were unable to get, we got almost all the presentation, but not the very end. So we do want to hear from you when there are questions, and um, maybe it's best yes. for you to, call, can you call in? Can we? Can yes, we? I think I'm going to call in because I'm just okay. having a really difficult time with the internet. I apologize, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, no. Patient. It was a very important presentation. Let me just to all the panelists address kind of a general question here. Um, it's obvious that, oh, there's so much heartbreak um, and there's just a lack of uh, adjusting to change and having any plan for what should happen with people who are at the border and how we deal with people with COVID in detention centers and how we give people a chance to um, to live fully in the United States and come up with a reasonable immigration policy. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, why is this such a mess? And what is it that we can do to bring attention to these important issues? There are a lot of important issues right now. There was a time when separation of children was all over the news and there was great concern about that, but then there's no follow-up. So we don't know what's happening now. We don't know there are hunger strikes going on. How do we get people to pay attention to the humanitarian crisis? And how do we get an immigration system set up that's humane? Um, whoever would like to, to start, that would be great. Aisha, you wanna start? Are you there? Aaron? I'm here. Um, Aaron, um, uh, Kathleen, would you like us to bring up our video? Yes, please. Bring up your video so everybody can see you now. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, as far as, uh, I, think it, I think it's difficult to know uh, or to explain why um, it's so messy. I think I'm going to go back to um, just social science and our dehumanization of the immigrant community and how easy it has been for policies to be implemented without remembering that we're dealing with human lives and that we're dealing with families. Um, and so I think it's uh, that these policies have been implemented without um, thinking about what eventually, how it impacts people, how it impacts family and how it impacts our country. I think it's easy for us um, to become xenophobic and to say that um, we don't want certain people here, that is what immigration law is about, controlling who comes in and out. But I think we've really lost touch with um, realizing that um, these policies, um, these laws, and that the way that they're implemented really impact um, humans and people living here in the United States. Erin, I'm yeah. There we go. I think, um, so I agree 100% with what Ace is saying, but I think one of the main issues that um, with this information, all the information that's been shared today is it's, it's done so far from 
uh, place, places that are accessible to, um, to media and, and also to advocates. So, um, you know, I've been, part of what I do is I study immigration laws and asylum. And so I was able to meet Uzo when I was in Tijuana. Um, but if I hadn't gone there, I would never know truly what's going on because you need to be able to see it for yourself because um, there's just not enough media coverage. Um, and it's dangerous to go to a lot of these places where um, these human rights violations are occurring. And in addition, you know, Aisa spoke a lot about detention. And, you know, Aisa and I work in the Dodge County Detention Center here. But I recently had um, clients who uh, were detained in California um, who went through Tijuana to, to um, seek asylum. And they were detained when there was a COVID outbreak. And it was rarely covered by the media. Um, until you know immigration advocates contacted the media and they said you know the, um core civic who runs the facility is asking us to sign a waiver um before we put on masks to say waiver of liability and so there's just um these this is all being done behind closed doors where people don't have access to it so i think it's just all, important for all of us to be really intentional and um, supportive of the movements and the organizations that are on the ground um, fighting for human rights. Kathleen, you're muted. I'm sorry. Okay, unmute, sorry. Um, well, there's so much attention on so many other issues right now. Obviously, the COVID is a huge story. The uh, the police brutality, uh, that certainly has become dominant in the news for the whole last week, story after story after story. How do we, ret we return to the images that brought horror to so many people? There was an awareness of all of these issues some months ago, but it's kind of disappeared. Um, how do we bring it, how do we bring it back? How do we, um, understand what's going on now and what we can do about it. Yeah, I can try. I think, um, you know, a couple of things, right? I think um, what we want to avoid is to false, false choices, right? So we don't have to pick between being healthy and asylum. We don't have to pick between working with um, trying to address sort of um, systemic racism and working with immigrants. But it, so that's the first step is to understand that we don't, these are, these are false choices, that these are, you know, these dichotomies do not have to exist, that all of these issues all have to do with um, sort of fairness. And um, they're all kind of rooted in the same sorts of things. Um, and that we can, that pushing, um, and we can all, we can push on all fronts on all of these issues that we, we should, the first step is to avoid feeling like you have to make these choices and to realize that all of these things are rooted in the same sorts of things. Yeah. We had a couple questions from um, people who are watching us about DACA. Uh, let's go to you on this, Erin. Um, somebody wanted to know a little bit more about choice one when you gave the two sure. choices. And also, I'm, I'm interested in your feeling about, do you have any sense where the court's going with this or not? Yeah, I think both of those are really good questions. You know, the first option um, that I listed was that the court would find that it didn't have, um, it, it, this question of DACA is not reviewable by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court can't review every case. And some of those, um, these policies, these issues are left better for the legislative um, or executive branch. And so we, um, I have a feeling that the Supreme Court will find that they can review this question, but if they find they don't, then it's left to um, the executive branch to terminate DACA. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Um, based on what you know, I observed through the Supreme Court arguments, um, my gut feeling is that the Supreme Court will um, find that this administration lawfully terminated DACA. Um, but that being said, recently they, um, the Supreme Court did, at, did ask for additional information on people with DACA who are fighting COVID on the front lines. So is that something they're gonna be taking into consideration or is that something that will be included in the dissent? It's hard to say and I don't want to, um, to make any conclusions right now. I think it's just best that we all prepare for, for both ways, what decision and also recognize that 
even if DACA continues, it's not a permanent solution. And people um, really deserve so much more. And I think, um, I think most people in this country believe that. So I think that's kind of where, mm -hmm. where we're at. Mm -hmm. It was really an important sense, sentence you just gave us. People deserve so much more. How true they do. Um, regarding a legislative solution, do DACA, this is from um, our participants, do DACA recipients favor separate legislation on DACA, the DREAM Act, or push for full comprehensive immigration reform? Yeah, and I can respond to this, and Aisa and Usa may have um, some additional comments on this. You know, I can't speak for, for people with DACA. That's not, um, I don't know what their specific perspective is. I think um, ultimately most people would like a fair and proactive immigration reform that offers um, a road to citizenship for a number of people. Because right mm -hmm. now it's, we have a broken system and we're creating um, populations that have less rights than others. And that's not what our immigration system should do. So um, it'll be in terms of a legislature, how, how do we lobby? How do people, well, I don't lobby, but how do people um, promote that? I think there have to be some really serious um, conversations and figure out to get the right people in office to make the correct decisions that um, allow us to have a fair immigration system. And we have a really long way to go. Mm -hmm. A question about those with green cards, why are they being detained? So um, undocumented, undocumented immigrants are not the only non-citizen subject to detention by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, a non-citizen, like a lawful permanent resident, can also be detained if they have a past conviction for what we call a deportable crime. Um, and so um, the only protection against deportation is becoming a US citizen. So green card holders, um, are subject to detention if they are found to be deportable and the Department of Homeland Security decides to initiate removal proceedings against them. Um, in the past, there was more discretion used um, um, in placing someone in removal proceedings, but now under these zero tolerance policies in this administration, we're seeing more Greek card holders be um, detained and we see them um, see them in detention, often not eligible to be released on bond um, and facing deportation and permanent separation um, from their families for sometimes things that happened uh, long ago. So it doesn't matter when it happened, um, the Department of Homeland Security can step in at any time and begin those proceedings for a deportable offense. Mm -hmm. These are all human stories too, and Uzumaka, I'm interested in it. I'm you've worked with thousands of people, well, many of you have. Uh, just tell us some of the more uh, poignant stories uh, that, that really filled you with outrage that this was happening to a human being who had a legitimate reason to be in the United States and probably faced terrible persecution if being deported. Can you hear me? Um. One, one of the most eye-opening um, incidents for me at the border, you know, was an education process for me because I was used to working with people, asylum seekers who had entered the country. And I had assumed that things were difficult and this is where the difficulty started. So going through the asylum system in the interior in Chicago with relatives was, I, I imagined that they had a really difficult time in their home country and they're having a really difficult time now in Chicago as they're trying to navigate right. the system, right? But what I realized when I got to the border is that the journey itself, right, that the whole experience at the border was intense and very, very, very mm. difficult. I was moved to see people who had walked 3,000 miles. I don't know if you can put mm -hmm. that in your brain, right? Um, there was one person who walked and with the, he, I met him and, you know, sort of checking your own biases in the door. I met him and his eyes were yellow and I assumed, okay, this person has liver disease. I wonder if there's alcohol involved. It was kind of what was going through the back of my mind. Only did I learn that he had been stabbed, right? Oh. And that as a process, his liver had been destroyed. Oh. And this person walked all the way to the border 
to have a chance to raise his hand to get asylum. And what really broke my heart was that I, that his golden ticket was going to be detention. That is if he's lucky. If he's unlucky, he would get sent back, maybe stuck waiting, right? That everybody's, what everybody's golden ticket is, is to enter CPB detention and to be there with the hope of going to ICE detention. And that this is like what we're offering people and what people are taking. And he said, um, I, I tried to prepare him for what was going to happen next. And he said, I'm prepared. The only thing is I hope they don't take away, he, he wore a brace around his body that um, I hope they don't take away this brace because I need it um, to, to walk. So those are the kinds of stories. It was just really going to the border was really um, an incredible experience for me because it, it, I got a chance to see that part of the story and it was a part mm. that occupied only two sentences in the affidavit mm. I was writing for my clients. But then to see those two sentences in full was amazing for me and just humbling and um, eye-opening and a lesson for me. Yeah. It makes you cry, doesn't it? Very sad. Uh, there was a question about advocacy groups, um, and we will have a list. It will be on the league's site of ways that people can help because this group will want to take some kind of action. Are there many advocacy groups? Are they, um, are they effective? Are they all over the country? What do you recommend? Aisha? Um, so there are um, a number of really great advocacy groups um, doing a lot of work. I mentioned the litigation that's going on around getting medically vulnerable people out of detention. That has been um, a huge movement across, you know, the U.S. right now and, and with litigators in federal court. That's where they're finding these remedies is in federal court, not before an immigration judge, right? Not with ICE, but in this federal court system, um, trying to find... Um, people to to order these releases and so um, I would say you know locally um, we have the community immigration law center we have the immigrant justice clinic we have Catholic charities in Milwaukee that also does um, in nonprofit work um, in Chicago we have the National Immigrant Justice Center and they have been um, you know a guiding light for us smaller organizations here in Wisconsin that don't see the volume of cases that they might see you know in Illinois um, and, and so I, I think that, you know, the ACLU is also stepping in and, and doing great work with litigation around immigration. Um, and so I'll invite my colleagues if you want to add anything. I don't want to miss anybody, but there is a lot of really great work going on, you know, in detention, on the border, for asylum seekers, for unaccompanied minors. It's just, there's so many things that need to be resolved and everybody kind of focuses on, on, on different issues. Mm hmm Erin? Yeah, I, I would... Um you know, agree with all of the resources that Aisa discussed. I'd also like to mention Al Otro Lado, and they're based in California, or a cross-border um, organization that runs these legal clinics in, um, in Tijuana now, and then there are additional um, programs in um, El Paso, Brownsville, that are working really hard to ensure that um, people have some sort of access to justice. And Uso and I have both worked with El Otro Lado, um, and I work with them. They help place cases also in Wisconsin. So if they meet a family, um, when I'm not down there, I've been down there a few times, they're able to connect with organizations throughout the states to um, help place them. In addition, I would really like to highlight the ACLU. Um, we had, I had two clients that I mentioned before detained in Oro Mesa Detention Center in California. And ICE, regardless of that one of our clients had um, HIV, um, was living with HIV, um, had a US citizen family member willing to house them and ready to help them. And they're from Cuba, very strong case for asylum, but ICE refused to release them from detention. And we continue to fight ICE to um, allow them to be paroled in the United States, which used to be normal um, for Cubans, because most Cubans, we, our government knows what goes on there and it's really well documented. But ICE still refused to release our clients, but the ACLU in California, um, they filed a federal lawsuit and used, um, helped our clients be released. And it was really, I don't know what we would have done without them. And I think mm -hmm. if more people in the United States knew what was going on, they would have been shocked by this. These, um, there was nothing controversial about these claims. Um, there was no, 
no threat to anyone. They were, they're just really lovely people, but ICE did everything in their power to keep them detained in a dangerous situation. And without the ACLU, they probably would still be there. Hmm. A question about um, how Mexico is handling asylum requests and the triangle countries, what they're doing for, we hear that there are a lot of people who are still in those triangle countries. Um, how are they faring? And Uzumaki, you were requested to respond to that. Sure. So Mexico, you know, has been, um, you know, initially when I thought the new Mexican president was coming, I, we, I was hopeful that there would be some pushback on the U.S. Um, sort of, I, I, would, I would argue that the U.S.'s approach now to asylum prior to COVID was sort of this outsourcing, right? So outsourcing of asylum management to um, Mexico. And what I mean by that is, and also to Guatemala and more, more recently um, to Honduras. And what I mean by that is that the U.S. government is asking Mexico to take more and more of a role in, so for, for example, when Mexico sends back, when U.S. sends back uh, migrants from Central America, they're sending them back to Mexico and, they're, and Mexico is accepting those people to live in Mexico. Um, the U.S. has also signed agreements with Guatemala and the other Northern Triangle countries that allows the U.S. to send back people to Guatemala to seek asylum, even though a large percentage of people who are seeking asylum in the United States are themselves from Guatemala. So we see um, the Trump administration has able to, been able to use both a carrot and stick approach to get the Mexican government and the Central American government to play a bigger role in this outsourcing of um, asylum management. Um, and um, and I, prior to COVID-19, I was going to say that that's gonna be a continued trend, um, that we will see more and more people being, um, being sent back, sent to Mexico. When we were at the border, Aaron, we had Mexican nationals who were being sent to Guatemala to uh, seek asylum. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are happening and this is the role that a lot of the um, Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries are playing. Uh, another question, is DHS concentrating their efforts to punish people from particular countries for political reasons? In other words, is DHS looking the other way for overstays from some countries while coming down hard on other countries? Whoever wants to respond, just, do we know? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is um, what we've seen, especially when Jeff Sessions was the Attorney General, um, in terms of really stripping um, any sort of helpful case law and um, regarding asylum from Central America. Um, is specifically what we term the Northern Triangle in terms of domestic violence being um, a claim for asylum as well as um, gang violence, non-governmental actors. And it's been really systematic um, and showing the power of the Attorney General to really force um, policies where people from Central America won't be eligible for asylum. Whereas if before the Trump administration, there were many ways for people to qualify for asylum from those countries, even though it was incredibly difficult to obtain asylum, there's been a, an, an intentional systematic dismantling of um, eligibility from asylum from, from those specific countries. Um, how is all that we've heard this morning not against international law and the U.S. Refugee Act? If so, is something being done about this? So that's a good question. This, this is why I started my presentation with the fact that is asylum international or domestic? So we have our own domestic um, asylum law, right? And so, um, and, and we also have other laws in our Immigration and National, Nationality Act. And sometimes our asylum law comes into tension with those other laws. So there are other laws that say, the president can do X, Y, and Z, right? So the president has a lot of power when it, control, when it comes to things that have to do with national security and foreigners. And sometimes those powers are in tension with what he can do with respect to what our laws say about who can seek asylum. The question is how will the US Supreme Court decide to balance those, that, those tensions, right? 
And so um, in right now, the Supreme Court is giving the president a lot of leeway, but there are lots of other litigation that are coming up that challenge whether or not the president should be able to do the things, have the policies that he has with respect to asylum. Okay. Um, do you sense that maybe we're entering, I mean, times are really hard right now. Um, people are, are having a very difficult time on this issue. It sort of hurts your, it sort of, it does. It hurts your soul when you see family separation. People were made sick by this. People are made sick by police brutality. People are just have been, they're just having a hard time um, with COVID, with everything. We're all depressed and anxious. There are also people who are saying this is a breaking point, that we're at a time with immigration, with race in this country, with so many other issues where a lot of people have said, uh, we have to change. We have to change or we're going to lose what this country is. We're going to lose America as America. Are, are each of you hopeful about what is ahead for us? Or are you deeply worried? Aisa? I, I think um, I think I'm hopeful. Um, I I think that um, we're currently coming to terms with um, you know systemic racism and how it impacts our Black and Brown communities, how it impacts our immigrant community and policy and immigration, um, and we're moving towards a co liberation and being able to um, really really see each other um, as moving forward and pushing. The, the message forward that um, racism is, doesn't, you know, have a place here in the United States. It doesn't have a place in our policies. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that, um, that we're not going to return to normal, that we're going to see um, new things come of this, that we're going to see new policies, and that we're going to bring and shed new light on what has been going on in this country. Well, I really needed to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Erin, what do you think? I, there are days that I am hopeful and there are days that I'm not hopeful, but I think I have to lean towards hopeful if I want to continue um, providing access to justice and due process for um, the people and the communities that I serve. But I am fearful if um, this administration has another four years, there's no coming back. And, um, you know, immigration law and humanitarian policies within the United States have never been perfect, but we have often been um, a leader in the world. We have been a leader in the world in terms of the number of refugees that we yes. we've have provided services for and allowed to come and live in our country. And I hope that we can fix our laws and our policies and we can have a leader who believes in human rights and isn't um, in, and lighting fires to um, to encourage people to be racist and encourage people to close our borders and encourage um, and spreading lies because we really need to lead with truth and we all have a lot of work to do. So I think if we all work and we learn and we're intentional, we can um, we can have change that we need. Uzumaka. you know I work with kids, so I'm I'm hopeful. Um, I think uh, the despite all of the things, what I've learned from the kids that I work is how resilient they are. Like they are so resilient. Um, and so I try to be resilient. I try to model after my behavior after them. I am worried about certain things, certain trends. I am worried that more and more our immigration policy will be set by whoever is president. And so we might have large swings. I am worried that we lack the political will and capital to do comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a result, we're going to, um, it, it just depends on who's the president um, and the and, um, immigration um, will become more and more something that any president can come in and decide what they will or will not do, which I think at the end of the day is not good for immigrants. Um, it's not good for um, um, the people that I represent. So that's the part of it that worries me the most. Um, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, what time are we supposed to end? Molly, are you there? Yeah, I believe we were ending at 1130. Oh, okay. Well, I guess it's, uh, 
about time for us to end. Um, we are going to provide, actually, let me, before we end, let's just go a couple minutes over. Do uh, each of our panelists have just one recommendation of what to read, of what organization to contact, of who to complain to? It, it just give us one thing that we can do. Aisa? Sure, so um, I'll just, I'll focus on my detention kind of piece. Um, the Community Immigration Law Center does provide universal representation um, to individuals in removal proceedings. And what that means is basically we make sure that there is an attorney for someone who is at risk of deportation if they live locally here in Dane County. And the Immigrant Justice Clinic also supports those efforts. Why is that important? Because people in detention who are at risk of deportation have the right to an attorney, but not the right to a government funded attorney. And so um, having a lawyer increases, you know, the, the likelihood that someone will be released and reunited with their family. Um, I invite people to read resources from detentionwatch.org. Um, NIJC has wonderful resources as well. Um, there's also um, a great book by a colleague of mine, and he did not ask me to plug this, but it's a really great book I've been working through by um, Cesar Potemo Garcia um, Hernandez and it's called uh, Migration, uh, Migrating to Prison, America's obsess Obsession with um, Locking Up Immigrants. And so um, that book um, really talks about the history of um, immigration prisons um, and I think that it's really shed a lot of light on, on some certain issues for me and I think it's written really beautifully so you can check out that book as well. Great. Erin? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I think we all just need to be intentional about knowing what is going on. So, you know, file, file, follow your trusted news sources, but also support your local nonprofits. And I think um, before we have access to justice and due process for everybody who's in um, immigration and in removal proceedings, we do, I agree with Aisa wholeheartedly that we need universal representation, that anybody who's facing removal from the United States deserves to have an attorney who will fight for their rights. So they're not sitting at a table with an immigration judge and a government attorney fighting for their de deportation. So I encourage everybody to learn more about the universal representation movement and support your local governments and encourage them to provide money to hire attorneys to represent people who are in removal, because without that, this is never going to be a fair system. Uzumaka. So you've done the first big thing, which was attend this panel and learn and get educated about what's going on, right? So um, I would follow I would follow up on some of the things that you've heard, right? So I would go in and do research on detention, about asylum, get the facts. And I would say the most important thing you can do is vote. If you if you that internet just... vote. I, I think it's 150 days now oh. to the election. <laughs> just by the way, I'm counting down. Um, <laughs> but it's to, <laughs> it's to become an educated consumer of the news and know where you're getting your news sources from. Practice going to the source, if possible, going and reading the executive orders, going and so look for the truth in the source. And then finally, go out in this amount of power about what to do with people who are non-citizens. And so if you want the president to do something differently, um, you have to vote. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. It's just been a real pleasure to listen to you. And thank you for all of your work. You just all, all three of you are getting rave reviews and lots of love from people on Facebook who have been watching you. Thank you so much. Uh, we also want to thank Molly Collins. Hey, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Hi. For technology, and I sure don't. She's on the staff at the AC Wisconsin, and um, she made this virtual Zoom town hall happen. Mary Sussman, one of the committee members who planned this event, said she came along at exactly the right moment. And the same could be said for everyone who's on this panel today. You came around at exactly uh, the same moment. Um, we will have, go to the League of Women Voters Milwaukee County site. There will be extensive information on resources. Thanks to the League for doing these forums. They're just a superb group of committed women who've been doing work. And this is such a big year for the League. They've been doing this for, you know, 100 years on so many issues. And they are great people. 
great, great people. I'm happy to be a member of that group. Um, I would just like to end with, you know, I always go to poetry in times that are difficult. So I'd just like to end with just a part of Langston Hughes, Let America Be America Again poem before we say goodbye. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream that it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain seeking a home where he himself is free. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. Thank you all. Thank you. We'll carry Thank on. You. Thank you.